I ordered the artillery to fire at the biggest palaces at the 10th floor Hrushevsky building. It burned down to the ground. I set the city on fire. The Duma was asking for a ceasefire. And I, while taking on a direct line with Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, told him that I want to lead the revolutionary army to conquer the entire world. This is a description of the storming of Kyiv by Soviet troops as described by their commander Mikhail Moraviov. He considered the occupation of the Ukrainian People's Republic just the first step in the great Bolshevik expedition against the whole Europe. Moreover, Lenin and Trotsky attempted such an operation less than a year later. However, the Red Army suffered a humiliating defeat in Poland at that time. But the idea of global domination had taken root in the heads of Bolshevik leaders. The unsuccessful Poland operation made the Bolsheviks draw a conclusion that rich nations aren't ready to start a revolution, as they are already well off under capitalism. This is why Moscow bigwigs adopted a new concept – to start the global revolution not in the highly developed European countries, as Karl Marx suggested, but go in the opposite direction – to the most famine-ridden regions – Africa and Southeast Asia. They believed that common folk there really had nothing to lose but their yoke. This is why Soviet diplomacy and the USSR's intelligence system started to incline the top African leaders en masse to proletarian friendship with the USSR, with both threats and the lure of big money. The idea espoused by Lenin and the first of his followers was to incite a global revolution. This is what the Soviet authorities aimed for. In fact, they put themselves on the threshold of another world war. Potentially, this would be a war that would have continued until the demise of the last capitalist state and the socialist revolution would reign supreme all over the world. Take, for example, Mozambique. Let's say, retrace the old Portuguese route, which was created to trade with India back during the Age of Discovery. And so here, Soviet strategists have clearly estimated that should pro-Soviet regimes be installed in this country, it will become the key to controlling a whole host of African countries that became independent. This control was necessary to cut European countries from their resource bases in Africa. After all, the former colonial powers, such as France or even Germany, continued the exploitation of resources from their former colonies. This is why, essentially, the USSR had no need for the African countries to which Soviet troops were sent. What the Soviet Union pursued was geopolitical influence. For example, Angola was selected as a staging ground for confrontation with the Republic of South Africa which in turn got assistance from the US. This means that the struggle still was in the USSR against US format. When the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, statistics of the USSR general staff were published. And it turned out that during the period between 1975 and 1991, almost 11,000 Soviet soldiers took part in armed conflicts in Angola alone. A bit more than 11,000 of Soviet military personnel fought in Ethiopia. But the Soviet invasion of Africa was started back in 1956, when the USSR chose to establish itself as the protector of Egypt. The Soviet Union provided Egyptian troops with the newest weapons, armor and military aircraft. The Egyptians themselves, as it turned out, had significantly overestimated their ability to use the equipment sent from the Soviet Union, which delivered the most modern aircraft of the time. But the Arabs were simply not ready to service them. This was the time that gave rise to a situation that soon grew to hilarious proportions. African and Asian friends of the USSR lacked sufficient qualifications to use in service military equipment provided by the USSR. Training qualified crews out of local soldiers took a long time. 
This is why the Soviet Union was forced to send not only the vehicles to Africa and Asia, but also soldiers and officers who fought using these vehicles, illegally of course. This is why there were jokes like this one. During the Vietnam War, American aviators are scanning the radio frequencies and happen to catch a pair of Vietnam pilots shouting in the heat of battle. Yu Su Shin, cover my six. Van Yu Shin, cover my six. Banushin, get moving and cover me already. Thus, it was the African and Asian military campaigns where the Soviet Union formed the concept of hybrid ghost soldiers, the presence of which Russian leaders deny without missing a beat. After all, there is a good reason why a song by Alexander Polivin, which became the anthem of the Russian Union of Angola veterans, contains these words. How, my friend, did fate get us stranded here? We have a major and urgent mission to accomplish, but they say we couldn't even have been near, and no Russian blood dripped on Angolan soil. Likewise, this happened in Vietnam. Soviet pilots shot down planes. And then, when Vietnam airmen started doing so themselves, Soviet propaganda was actively spread. The Vietnamese shot these planes down all by themselves. Soviet airmen were to be hidden, just like all Russian specialists doing the legwork. The Vietnamese, on the other hand, were on the country being glorified. Look, they learned how to shoot down American phantoms. In the 60s, there already was a special 10th department at the General Staff of the USSR, which prepared guerrilla units that worked beyond the borders of the Soviet Union. These squads were formerly a part of Army Special Forces battalions, but were stationed separately. Usually, that was on the territory of Army prisons. This was very convenient. The territory was cordoned off from curious eyes, so it was possible to use the prisoners for hard training, and finally, there was the training base itself. The high command usually claimed that these guerrillas were teams of athletes, wrestlers, boxers and sharpshooters. It was a well-known fact that Soviet army athletes frequently won national competitions and sometimes even traveled abroad to compete in the Olympics. Thus, their athletic capabilities also created a convenient cover story for sending them across the USSR borders. The Soviet Union recruited a rather dubious contingent of Kurdish militants, who were trained at military bases in Central Asia. They were trained as a military force. They were ideologically pumped up to fight and give their lives for their independence. And the Soviet Union, at every opportunity, fueled the feeling that it was ready to provide support for the Kurds to secure their own independent state. Finally, in the 1950s, these units were infiltrated with the direct objective of sabotage. One of the first groups of foreign saboteurs was the team of Kurdish leaders Mustafa Barzani, which numbered more than 500 militants. When the monarchy in Iraq fell, these saboteurs returned to their homeland and took key positions in the new Kurdish Revolutionary Army, which was engaged in guerrilla warfare against the Iraqi government forces. Their goal was to tear certain territories away from Iraq. The thing is that the Soviet Union was exploiting this situation in quite a cynical fashion. On the one hand, it fueled separatist sentiment, trained units of separatist militants, and performed practical tests on how they act, and most importantly, how the international community would react to their actions. On the other hand, the Soviet Union also successfully cooperated with their opponents. And what was really underhanded on the part of the USSR is that, at the same time, it was providing anti-air trainers and pilot navigators to the Iraqi military. They were the ones who aimed Iraqi planes at Kurd separatists, which Moscow also brought there. The USSR used this same scenario in many other conflicts up until its very collapse. The same templates were used by modern Russia in the North Caucasus, Transnistria and other regions. In other words, USSR leaders 
were doing the same thing they were accusing the US of. They were training militants for the Islamic Middle East, and these initially Moscow-controlled guerrillas in time grew independent and shifted towards radical Islamism with terrorist leanings. When it comes to this specific region of the Middle East, and we understand that in the future these countries became the center of territory that spawned ISIS, then it obviously was created on the basis of those paramilitaries, which in turn, to a certain known extent, were initially formed by the Soviet Union to fight against Israel. These include the well-known Hezbollah and others. And then there always comes a moment, and we know this from history, when such movements haven't passed a certain stage and haven't received sufficient financial support, weapons and such, start playing their game, so to speak. This means that the Islamic State, ISIS, to some extent is the brainchild of the USSR and modern Russia. After all, it couldn't have been by accident that a significant part of its militants comes from post-Soviet territories. In this case, just like in many others, they used a hybrid Russian technology under the codename Separatism Exports. Its essence is that they find several local politicians with separatist aspirations, and these politicians receive a generous funding from Moscow. Subsequently, the politicians assemble themselves a political organization, preferably with a military wing, and with instructors handpicked from among representatives of Russian special services. At the same time, the Russian foreign ministry prepares a cover story as to a reason why some territory must be split off from its country. Once the groundwork is laid, they start an active stage, which frequently involves armed conflict. Incidentally, the first president of Georgia, Zviad Gamsahuria, took a categorical position about not joining the Commonwealth of the Independent States. He considered it enough that Georgia proclaimed its independence and participation in the liquidation of the Soviet Union was not mandatory for Georgia. And here most likely Zviad Gamsahurdia and his successor, Eduard Chavardnadze, were made to understand that it won't be possible for the Georgian people to exit the Soviet Union so easily. And just on time, a hotbed of separatism sprung up in North Ossetia and Abkhazia, directly supported by Russian troops and mercenaries from the Caucasus regions. In fact, that Russia is creating a belt of instability in the post-Soviet space was announced by the Ukrainian representative Volodymyr Yelchenko from the UN Rostrum back in 2017. But this instability is not chaotic. It is clearly controlled from Moscow by transferring those same Russian guerrillas to the conflict zone, by filling the years of the population in separatist regions with propaganda, and by applying direct international pressure. We're observing all of this here in Ukraine as well. The main objective was firstly to create areas of instability, and then using these areas of instability, legitimizing its direct interventions in the region and diplomatic intervention, thus infringing the rights for self-determination of these countries. And in fact, Russia has always managed to achieve this goal. In Karabakh, in Transnistria and in Abkhazia and North Ossetia. This was done incidentally to the complete silence of the world community. However, the situation has changed thanks to Ukraine. Russia broke its teeth with the so-called Novorossiya. But we'll talk about this in the next program. In the meantime, remember that each phenomenon has its pros and cons, its pro and contra.